you wonder why I'm uh, standing so close to you, it's so that I can spit on your faces. But no, if you, uh, I think Zach and Jimmy might need a rag, though. But no, the real reason is the computer's in there and it can reach and it's going directly into that computer and we'll probably get an extension or something and I'll be back there after a while. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. And in keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. And if you have trouble hearing back there, just uh, cut the air off and it'll be easier. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom so that we might assemble this portion of the word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now Matthew presents Jesus Christ as Messiah, the King. And it's always important to know when a book is written, a book especially in the Bible, is to who is the audience. And in this case, uh, Matthew uh, wrote this originally to the Jews. And it was written originally in Aramaic. And Matthew is also called Levi, the tax collector. And since he was a tax collector, he was despised by fellow Jews because they almost looked at him like a traitor for collecting taxes for the Roman Empire. Yet, as we note later, it was part of their duty to pay unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. <clears throat> the exact date of the writing is unknown, uh, but since it was uh, written before the fall of Jerusalem and before Luke's account of Jesus' life on earth, it's c concluded that the Aramaic text was written at about 45 A.D., and then the Greek text was later written in 50 A.D., now we're going to get an outline of Matthew uh, by chapters. Chapters 1 through 4 give us a chronological approach. Chapters 5 through 13 give us a logical and topical approach. And chapters 14 through 28 give us the chronology of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are certain characteristics about Matthew. First of all, it uh, presents the great teachings of our Lord, such as the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount is found in chapters 5 through 7. The Temple Discourse, chapters 21 through 23. The Olivet Discourse, 24 through 25. And he also included much about the Gentiles because as he was presenting this to the Jews, he wanted them to uh, make sure of the importance of the birth of Christ to the Jews. And he, so he brings in a lot of uh, things concerning the Gentiles, inclu including Gentiles in the genealogy of Christ. And that's something that would have been unheard of to a Jew. A Jew looked down on Gentiles. And the fact that it's included in genealogy, not only Gentiles, but women Gentiles, and not only women Gentiles, but women prostitute Gentiles in the line of Christ. And this presents the grace of God to Jews who were steeped in legalism. And so uh, he was trying to smack them in the face and say, here is the grace of God. And it is such as that. And also we have the story of the Magi who come from the West. And, that, uh, and there's a quotation on how the Gentiles would be saved in Matthew 28, 18. There are unique fa uh, factors of Matthew. First of all, it describes the repentance of Judas. And remember that word is metamelomai. And that repentance was he felt sorry for what he did, but he did not get saved because he felt sorry for what he had done. The repentance of Judas, not his salvation. And then we have the Jewish request that the uh, blood of Jesus be on them and their children. That's found in Matthew 27, 25. 
and consequently this was left out of the Passion of the Christ because of the controversy it uh, stirred up, which is ridiculous. It's part of Scripture. And they did say, uh, let the blood of Jesus be on them and their children. And uh, that's, uh, we'll get to that later. The resuscitation of the saints is unique to Matthew, and that is found in Matthew 27, 51 through 52. And this was the resuscitation of the saints, not the resurrection of the saints. They were resuscitated, and many of the dead of old were walking around after the crucifixion of Christ. Then we have the fabricated story of the empty tomb. That's unique to Matthew. That's found in Matthew 28, chapters 11, or 28, verses 11 through 15. So looking at Matthew 1, 1, uh, we'll start there. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And these titles represent the fulfillment of the unconditional covenants. Because remember, it was to David that our Lord said, you will have a king come from your loins that will reign forever and ever. And David was so shocked by that, by God's grace, that he prostrated himself on the ground and began to worship God. And yet, uh, well, that was his uh, physical, well, in his uh, physical, in having the uh, procreation of, of Christ on down the line, this was something that really uh, shocked him. But we should be even, uh, we should prostrate ourselves even more because we have Christ in us, something David didn't have. He got excited just because he would be in the lineage of Christ. And we have Christ in us. So we have something greater as in contrast to the Old Testament and we'll be looking at some of these things related to Matthew as well. How our spiritual life is so uh, much greater than those of the Old Testament. But this was uh, the reason he said David and then Abraham a right off starting out is because of the fulfillment of the unconditional covenants that from Abraham's bosom would come the Lord and from David would come uh, Jesus Christ in his humanity. And this was very important. And it's very important to note that the unconditional covenants were fulfilled. And so uh, the millennium too, as an unconditional covenant too, will be fulfilled. And uh, this reminds me of a story. It's a true story. I don't re remember the names of the characters involved. But there was an atheist and then there was a believer there, a scholar of the Bible, and then there was a Jew. And the atheist said, well, you prove to me that there's a God. And the biblical scholar pointed at the racial Jew and said, there's your proof. They're still here. And that is why uh, they're always under attack. And some of you might be going to D.C. I recommend the Holocaust Museum. It is a phenomenal place. Some of it can get pretty eerie, especially when you stand in the same box carts or those train uh, things that uh, the Jews were carted off in to be exterminated. Well, that's part of Satan's policy to exterminate the Jew. But it will not work because the unconditional covenants will be fulfilled just as these were from the son of David and the son of Abraham. Then in uh, verse 2, it says Abraham. Now, Abraham was the first Jew on the basis of regeneration because he had believed in Christ and no other reason. So he's the first Jew on the basis of regeneration. And of course, when he was circumcised, that was uh, showing that he had reached spiritual maturity. And that was the point when he actually went from Abram or Abram to Abraham. But we have Abraham. And uh, he was the pattern for all Old Testament salvation. That's found in Romans. Uh, where it says Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. That was the Old Testament pattern for salvation and it is also our pattern for uh, salvation. Abraham was also one of the greatest illustrations of spirituality and that is because of his uh, fantastic use of the faith rest drill. That's found in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 8 through 9 and also mentioned again in James chapter 2, 21 through 24. So Abraham's significant and he is in the line of Christ. Abraham fathered Isaac, Isaac fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Judah. Now actually Jacob also fathered Reuben. And it would have been Reuben who would have been in the lineage of Christ, but he stepped out of line. 
And this is chronicled in First Chronicles chapter 5. And he lost all of his firstborn privileges. To Judah, and this is important because it, uh, well, it's part of biblical history. To Judah, he lost the sovereign status as ruler of the tribes. And to Levi, he lost his priesthood. So we have the priesthood now going to Levi. And to Joseph, he lost his double portion. And that went to his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So we have Jacob fathering Judah, even though he also uh, fathered uh, Reuben, but he lost it, and it went to, uh, and then it says, and his brothers, and the reason it says, and his brothers, is because his brothers were unbelievers, so they're not mentioned by name in the genealogy. Judah fathered Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. And if you were here when I first started, Matthew, you remember the story of Tamar. And you remember the story of how uh, she was uh, being used. And so what she did is, uh, well, uh, she was to marry this man who decided to go back into the Phalic cult. And she was supposed to marry him, but he didn't do it. So she disguised herself as one of the Phalic cult uh, women who freely gave of their bodies in the temple as part of their sacrifice. And uh, she demanded to wear his signet ring. And so the signet ring signified that she could get whatever she asked from this man. And so Tamar wore the signet ring. And then afterwards she went up to him and said, Okay, I can uh, get whatever I ask from you. Marry me, which is what she wanted him to do in the first place. So she was quite a schemer and very smart. And if any man thinks he can uh, pull something over a woman, remember, she, she can be very smart and conniving at times. And that is part of Tamar mentioned in the lineage of Christ. And to have a woman in the lineage is uh, definitely something else because they didn't like to do that. They always looked down on the woman. And then uh, we have the fact that she was a Gentile female. And not only that, she prostituted herself out. And, all, and she's in the lineage of Christ. And what happened, re, you remember when Ur uh, suddenly died, that's who she was married to. And then, according to law, she would have to marry the brother, which would be Omar. Then he suddenly died. And then uh, uh, Judah sent her home, and it was Judah who should have married her. And actually, in the end, he ended up having to marry Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram. And then in verse 4, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashlan, Nashan fathered Solomon, Solomon fathered Boaz, and this is by Rahab, another woman in the genealogy, a Gentile woman who was a former prostitute. Later she became a marvelous believer, and along with her there are four other women in the genealogy, all representing the grace of God. So there we have uh, the second woman mentioned, Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed, and this was by Ruth, a Moabitess. And you remember the Moabites were always the enemy of the Jew. But here she is listed in Christ's genealogy, another reference to God's grace. Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David, the king. And then, of course, the unconditional covenant given to David that his son would rule forever. That's part of Scripture, and it's important to see David and Abraham because remember, this is written for a Jewish audience. And they would, uh, and well, what Matthew's saying is look, by the genealogy, he definitely is the king of the Jews. There's no way around that. So if you haven't believed in him as your Savior, well, look at the genealogy and you can see that it fulfills what Isaiah said and it's part of Scripture and this uh, came to pass. So he is king of the Jews and he is your Savior. Then we have Solomon and Solomon was the monarch, the last monarch of the United Kingdom and Solomon died in 926 B.C. And that was the year that the kingdom of Judah was split in two into the southern kingdom called Judah and the northern kingdom, Samaria and Ephraim. And that's because Solomon's son who took over was an idiot and the kingdom split. But all the way through Solomon's reign, they had peace and prosperity up until 926 B.C. And it was uh, more David's uh, fault that they had peace and prosperity, not uh, to deal much with Solomon. Although later in life, he did get back with the word of God 
not as much though as his father did. All that is in Scripture. So Solomon fathered Rehoboam the idiot, the one who split the kingdom. Rehoboam fathered Abijah, and Abijah fathered Asa. Asa fathered Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat fathered Joram, and Joram... And here we have a three-generation gap in genealogy due to the introduction of religion in the southern kingdom. And this is when Jehoshaphat tried to reunite the tribes by marrying his son Ahazai to a woman named Aphelia and the daughter of Jezebel and Jehu. And the daughter of Jezebel was just about as vicious as Jezebel herself. So she tried to have all the royal family killed. So we have a three-generation gap because of the turmoil of history at that time. And then Joash finally came to the throne in 839 and ruled till 800. And so the reason why we have a three-generation gap is because of the turmoil at the time. And Joram fathered Uzziah. And Uzziah fathered Jotham, and Jotham fathered Ahaz, and Ahaz fathered Hezekiah. Hezekiah fathered Manasseh, Manasseh fathered Ammon, Ammon fathered Josiah. Josiah was the grandfather of Coniah. And Coniah should ring a bell in your ears because of Coniah's curse. Coniah's curse is talked about in Jeremiah chapter 22, 24 through 30. And it was promised to him that none of his offspring would come to the throne. And it's true. And from Coniah, it goes all the way down to Joseph. But remember, Joseph did not father our Lord Jesus Christ. He did not have a human father because if he would have, he would have possessed the old sin nature. That's why Jesus Christ had to be born from a virgin. Remember, in Adam all die. Christ was not in Adam. He was uh, actually conceived by God the Holy Spirit, so he had no sin nature. And we all have sin natures because we all have fathers. And that is uh, the how it occurs. So Joseph uh, never would be the father of the humanity of Christ. He was cut off because of Coniah's curse. So even the human lineage of Jesus Christ actually goes through Mary, a woman that is his humanity, not his deity. The Catholics call uh, Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ uh, mother in his humanity. She was his mother, but they call him, they call her the mother of God, the mother of his deity. He is not. She was not the mother of the deity. She was the mother of his humanity, and we'll study that under the hypostatic union. Jesus Christ was uh, both God and humanity incarnate in hypostatic union. So Mary is not the mother of God, but the mother of the human nature of Jesus Christ. And Mary was a sinner just like all of us. And we should never pray to Mary. And you should know that by now. We went over prayer yesterday that we pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ and in the filling of God the Holy Spirit. So we have here... <clears throat> Um, about uh, uh, Joram fathered Uzziah and then uh, jo jo Jotham fathered Ahaz and Ahaz fathered Hezekiah Hezekiah fathered Manasseh Manasseh fathered Ammon Ammon fathered Josiah Josiah was the grandfather of Coniah where the Coniah curse occurred and his three brothers and again no naming of the brothers because the brothers were unbelievers and unbelievers well, they didn't want to include them in the genealogy. About the time of the deportation to Babylon. The deportation to Babylon occurred in 586 B.C. That is when Israel went under the fifth cycle of discipline. Yet the line of Christ continues, which shows God's grace and uh, ability to have stability even when history uh, goes awry as history is going awry now, as long as uh, you are positive toward the Word of God, you will be shielded from all the terrible things that will eventually come down the pike as you are uh, believers who are positive toward the Word of God. So the deportation of Babylon happened in 586 B.C. The Israelites went under slavery. After the deportation to Babylon, Kaniah became the father of Shealtiel. And so even under deportation, even under these terrible circumstances God's grace continues the line of Christ continues so even under the great pressures of adversity God provides stability 
Then a Shealtiel fathered Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel fathered Abiud. Abiud fathered Eliakim. Eliakim fathered Azor. Azor fathered Zadok. And Zadok fathered Akim. And Akim fathered Eliud. And there's not really a much significance we can uh, gain out of these uh, people's names. But you can always uh, look up Eliud and see what he did in his life. As well as Eleazar and Methan. And Methan fathered Jacob. And of course, Jacob's very famous. And you can read about his stories in the Bible. And Jacob, uh, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. And so, uh, something to, uh, well, uh, point, uh, verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the de deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation of Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. And if you read some commentaries, they'll say, uh, why, what is the significance of the 14 generations? And they'll say, because seven is fullness and then multiply it by two. Well, I really don't see any uh, connection to the number seven or anything like that. It's just the way Matthew uh, designed it in his, well, he was being very methodical and wanted to uh, show that in his writing. So now we go to the birth of the king. This is found in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ happened this way, while his mother Mary was engaged to Joseph. Now, if you were engaged in those days, it was a lot different than today. If you get engaged today, you can break it off, and it's just like breaking up with your girlfriend. There's no significance to it. But betrothal in those days was just as significant as marriage. And if the woman who was betrothed were to commit adultery, it would be considered adultery, and she would have to be stoned as per the Mosaic law. So engagement was important. It was a legal document that showed you were going to get married. But in the betrothal stage, there is no sexual relations between the man or the woman, or there shouldn't be, until the marriage. But it's still legally binding. So while his mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, but before they had sexual relations, this is important because it wants to make it very clear that there's no possibility that uh, Jesus Christ had the old sin nature passed down to him from a, uh, a human, a man. And that did not occur, so there were no sexual relations. She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. This is the immac Immaculate Conception. Verse 19. Because Joseph, her hus husband-to-be, was a noble man, and he was a noble man, he was actually the true son of David, and he was royalty. And not only that, this man acted like royalty. He was a man of integrity. And because he did not want to disgrace her, and disgrace, well, that's going kind of light, uh, she would have been stoned to death if he had said, look, I've never had sex with her, now she's pregnant, she's been fooling around on me, they would have stoned her and she would have died. But because he did not want to disgrace her, he intended to divorce her privately. Now there's more to it, to that. Because if he were to, he could do it. It was very easy to get a divorce back in those days as it is today. But if, if he would have said to uh, uh, the judge, hey, she committed adultery, he would have no payment. He would not have to pay a dime. And she would be stoned. And most people without integrity would have said, you know what, uh, get rid of her. I'm not paying a dime for this whore. That's the way they would have looked at it. But he, if he, if he quietly divorced her, would have to pay money to do so. Not just a little bit either. It was quite a hunk of money back then. And so he was so noble, he was willing, even though he thought that she had run around on him, he was willing to simply divorce her quietly and put up the money for it and go on his own way and spare her. This was a man of nobility and integrity. And uh, you ladies, if you're ever looking for someone, look for someone with integrity. Look for someone like Joseph. He obviously had something uh, close to grace orientation because most men would have gotten so jealous and angry and uh, probably even gotten angrier when he heard the story because it sounded so fallacious. 
And that had never happened before in history. And so the little lady comes up and says, I have uh, a conception in me by a God, the Holy Spirit. Well, you would think she had lost her mind and you would think she was trying to get out of something and being stupid. And when he thought that she might have been trying to get out of something, but he did not act on jealousy or any of that. Grace orientation, a phenomenal man just from looking at this, a true uh, man of royalty, and he acted like royalty. When he had contemplated about this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, in a dream and said, Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child conceived in her is from the source of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people. And this is a corrected translation. You are not saved from your sins. You are saved from the ultimate source of your sins, the old sin nature. And that is when you're a believer in Christ, you can actually be filled with God, the Holy Spirit, and you are not functioning under sin. An unbeliever always functions under the old sin nature. There's not a time when the believer is not functioning. Unbeliever, there's not a time when an unbeliever is not functioning under the old sin nature. So when you see unbelievers, what you are seeing is a living, talking, breathing old sin nature. Now they might function under establishment principles. And they might know that they shouldn't cheat on their wife. And they might be very good husbands and they might do very well in their work but they're still a walking, breathing sin nature. So we are saved from the ultimate source of sin, the sin nature, when we are experientially sanctified. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do this apart from Jesus Christ. So when people say, Jesus has saved me from my sins, that's ridiculous because they still sin. He saves, saved them from the source of sin, the old sin nature. This all was accomplished so that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah is uh, very significant because he was one of the first two prophets other than Jesus Christ. He being the first. He was the first of the two prophets who warned of the coming fifth cycle of discipline 500 years before it happened. And he mentioned that the fifth cycle of discipline, he mentioned three signs of it for Israel. The prophet Isaiah did. The first was the, the warning of the virgin birth. That would be the first warning, hey, it's the, virgin, the virgin birth has occurred. Israel, you're getting close to the fifth cycle of discipline. That's Isaiah, the first prophet to warn of these things. So, the warning of the virgin birth. The warning of the unique crucifixion of the Messiah. So Isaiah actually warned about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That was a warning of the coming fifth cycle of discipline because they would hang Christ on a cross. And then third was the gift of tongues. And the gift of tongues would be the third sign of the coming of the fifth cycle of discipline in Israel. Because uh, Isaiah said, you will hear foreign tongues in your land. And in his day, what he was thinking about would be foreign tongues of invaders. And that's what Isaiah would probably think about. But as prophecy turns out, that uh, actually they would hear the gospel in foreign tongues, part of the gift of tongues, and that should be a warning to a, that client nation that, because they were the ones that were supposed to be giving the gospel to all the world. But instead, suddenly they start hearing in foreign tongues all of this about the gospel and are able to understand it, that's a warning to them. They're hearing the gospel of Christ in a foreign tongue. That means most definitely they're not functioning as they should as a client nation, so they're about to fall under the fifth cycle. So it's Isaiah who brought out the three warnings. And now in Matthew, he mentions Isaiah because all of these warnings came to pass and in August of 70 A.D., the fifth cycle of discipline would also come to pass. So uh, what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah would be fulfilled. Look, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And they will call him Emmanuel. And actually, because they have the word Emmanuel there, indicates that the original manuscript was not Greek. It was Aramaic. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means, actually, there's a definite article here, the God 
with us. And the, this is the incarnation, the hypostatic union, our Lord incarnate, the God-man, and true humanity. And all of this is listed in Scripture, His uh, humanity and His deity functioning together in one body. In Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 11, John chapter 1, 1 through 14, Romans chapter 1, 2 through 5, and some other passages relating to the hypostatic union, which we will study in detail in the future. Look, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means the God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife. So he didn't even uh, question it but at this time. He had been told by the Lord that this was true, what she had told him. So all of that worry went out of his soul, and he took her as his wife. In Bethlehem, <coughs> excuse me, so they took him uh, as his wife. Now, I lost my place here. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, of Judea, well, he, and then it goes on to said, when Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but did not have sexual relations with her until after she gave birth to her first son, whom he named uh, Jesus. And Joshua is actually what it says in the Hebrew, and this means Savior. So even his name means Savior. Now we're going to look at the protection of the king in chapter 2. And we're going to see something about the Magi. Now, uh, I've learned that you cannot gleam uh, from the silence of Scripture anything. If, there, if Scripture doesn't say much about it, there's a reason for it, and we can't go around speculating about it. But before we learn about the Magi, I want you to turn in Luke. And uh, this is a parallel story to the Magi. And we will compare and contrast what happened in Luke with what happens here in Matthew uh, chapter 118. So it's uh, Luke chapter 2, verse, uh, well let's start at verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And this story, I like the story, uh, Luke story, a bit better than the one in Matthew, but they're both significant and both important because Matthew uh, wanted to bring out the Magi as Gentiles. Gentiles coming all the way from Persia to see the king of the Jews. And Matthew wanted to say, look, these Gentiles uh, recognize something significant was happening, how they recognized it. We'll get into that in a moment. But they were recognizing something by seeing the star. And so what Matthew is saying is, look, even the Gentiles were impressed by the birth of Jesus Christ. You need to take note. Now, in Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 8, he's dealing with uh, someone else. He's dealing with actual Jews. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And these shepherds were often ostracized by religious society because the shepherds would oftentimes have to do some work on the Sabbath. And they were ostracized by all the religious nuts for doing so. Yet what they were doing, these shepherds had a special job. And they were shepherding over sheep that would be used in sacrifice to God. So these shepherds were believers, but they were ostracized because uh, they, they were looked at as not following the law. Yet they were uh, better. They had believed in Christ when many of these uh, heretics hadn't even believed in Christ. And so what happens with the shepherds? Verse 9. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now this being terrified, uh, we associate fear with sin, and it is. But in this case, it's not. Because this is outside of their frame of reference. The glory of the Lord shining around you. You're seeing stuff you've never seen before. Well, it's outside of your frame of reference. It's going to be a natural human reaction to be terrified. If it were to happen in here, that suddenly a great bright light shone everywhere, I would imagine all of us would scream out of terror, wondering what in the world was going on. So that's what they did. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, totally outside of their frame of reference. They could have never dreamed anything like this would happen, so they were terrified. 
But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Now look how specific uh, this angel is going to be with these believers. Very specific. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This is in contrast to the Magi, which we're going to look at in a minute. They didn't have specifics. And if, well, we'll get to that. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in uh, your Bible, probably says swaddling clothes. These are death clothes. At birth, Jesus was wrapped in death clothes. Clothes. This was to represent the fact that Jesus Christ would go to the cross and die as a substitute for all of us. So it was definitely death clothes, not swaddling cloths and not just a cloth. It was a death cloth to represent something. And lying in a manger, not a manger, a feeding trough. Also another analogy for something. We will feed off the Lord Jesus Christ. When we believe in him, we receive 39 irrevocable things plus one. And this is us feeding off of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was born in a feeding trough. So they were very, uh, well, the angel of the Lord was extremely uh, specific uh, so that they would know they had reached the Savior. Told them exactly that they would be, he would be wearing death clothes. Uh, that would separate him from all the other babies in Bethlehem. And he would be lying in a feeding trough. That would definitely separate him from all the other babies in Bethlehem who were probably in something comparable to a manger. But Jesus wasn't. It was a unique birth. And this is the sign to them. Not only a sign to them, but a sign to us. Death clothes and a feeding trough. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men, actually peace in men, we receive uh, peace from learning the word of God, on whom, favor he, uh, on whom his favor, grace, rests. So we see here, well, let's continue for a little bit. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So this occurred, and immediately uh, they get up and move to Bethlehem. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the feeding trough. When they had seen him, now this is significant. We can't get anything out of the silence of Scripture, but uh, we'll see here. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So they, uh, after they learned that he was the Messiah, well, they evangelized to everyone who would listen. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Uh, so Mary really uh, thought about it. Uh, the other people marveled about it, but there's no indication that many of them were saved uh, from the shepherd's message, except Mary really took heart to these things and pondered them, and of course she uh, believed in Christ. Now compare this and contrast this with the story of the Magi. The Magi are Gentiles, and the Magi... Well, they're, they're famous in history. Even Daniel was part of the uh, Magi at one point, except Daniel was a believer, and every one of his dreams that he would interpret and everything that he did came to pass. And the other Magi, uh, meaning the magicians of the time, uh, the wise men as they were, wise because, well, they could interpret certain things. And a lot of the Magi, even though they always dress them up and uh, glorify them in churches, a lot of the Magi uh, actually were involved in demon activity, in astrology. And when you uh, read your horoscope, well, they did things such as that in the kingdom of Persia. Read horoscopes, tell your future, all of those things as wise men. Now, were they believers? Well, I cannot uh, uh, grasp anything from the silence of Scripture, but it's brought out anyway because these uh, magi are Gentiles and coming uh, to see the significance 
of the birth of Christ. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the time of King Herod, and King Herod is a character in himself, he is definitely known for his vast building projects. And he would uh, use all of his money to do uh, tremendous things with his uh, building projects. And in fact, he was building more at that time than anyone else in all of the Roman Empire. And he was uh, very kind to the Jews at first, but then he became embittered toward the Jews later in his life, and he became a very cruel man, and he died a very horrific death. And part of his horrific death had to do with his punishment for what he is about to do. And what he is about to do is uh, terrible, but it's all part of prophecy as well. We won't go into all the history of King Herod. I'm going to keep Matthew uh, pretty concise and to the point, and when it's time to uh, elaborate on some of the spiritual matters, I will, of course, uh, but on King Herod, uh, we might study him at some point later, but I'm going to keep this uh, concise. If you want to hear uh, all about the Old Testament history of uh, King Herod, I suggest you hear Colonel Thames Matthew series. He went into great detail on King Herod. I'm not going to do that. It would just be a uh, repetition, uh, really. And if you want to hear about that, that's fine. But there's a very little spiritual significance to it. So we have a uh, King Herod. And then a Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Now note, well, there's significance to it historically in knowing these things, but it's not, not uh, much we can glean for from it as part of our spiritual life. So uh, note the Magi. They came to Jerusalem. They didn't go to Bethlehem, which means they didn't know Scripture. Otherwise, they would have known that it was Bethlehem where the Christ was to be born. So why did they go to Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem was the hub in Israel, and they had an idea that the, it would be the king of Israel, so they went to Jerusalem, the political hub of Israel. And while they were there, they grabbed the attention of some very powerful people, King Herod included. So I'm not going to surmise and say that there was a demon influence that took them straight to uh, King Herod so that he would hear about the birth of Christ and because later they are warned not to go back and they follow the Lord's instructions. Were they saved along the way? Well, the scripture is pretty much silent about it. And Matthew is teaching this or talking about this just to show the Jews that even Gentiles from far away recognize something significant was about to happen. And believe me, all the demons knew something significant had happened. And the Magi, the magicians, had, uh, well, most of them had a great contact with the demon world. And so what is odd about this is that they end up in Jerusalem, the political hub, and gain the attention of King Herod. And they were, and they were saying this, where is the one who is born king of the Jews? And why did they say born? Because it would offend King Herod most definitely because King Herod was not born a king. He was appointed king over Israel. So immediately he would get suspicious and say, what do you mean someone's born the king of the Jews? I am their king. He would get very jealous and he would want to definitely secure his power. That's the way he was. And so it immediately grabbed his attention, these uh, foreigners talking about the birth of a king that was born king of the Jews. And then they said, For we have seen and calculated his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now Jesus Christ is called uh, the son of the morning star. And there was a big bright star at that time. No, There's no way around that. And a lot of scholars say it has to do with the conjunction of uh, Saturn and Jupiter or what some of those two planets to make a bright star. Well, either way, what it was was a bright star and uh, it was uh, there and that is what it was. And how it came to pass, well, it, God could have just put it there or it could have been the conjunction. It really has no significance either way and we will not uh, gleam anything from the silence of Scripture in that matter. This all was a, this, uh, and so, uh, for we have seen and calculated his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was alarmed and all Jerusalem with him. 
So immediately the Magi had contact with the uh, people in authority and in power, uh, which is strange. So after assembling all the chief priests and experts in the law, he examined them as to where the Christ was to be born. So the Magi did not have specific information like the uh, shepherds did. When the angel went to the shepherds, he told them specifically what to look for, specifically where to go. Go to Bethlehem. The Magi, they didn't really know. They're wandering around Jerusalem asking questions. Now, if it had been from God, you would think it would go. They would they would have went straight to Bethlehem. They would have known the directions explicitly. But they did know about it, and that's significant. So. What we see here is they get the ear of King Herod. And he had to assemble all the scholars of the Old Testament scripture. And they knew where the Christ was to be born right off the top of their heads. And without argument, they all said, in Bethlehem of Judea. That is where the Christ is to be born. So this signifies that if the Magi were believers, they knew nothing of scripture. And knew nothing of where the Christ was to be born. And I will not say any more because I'm not going to surmise on the silence of Scripture. It just doesn't uh, give us enough information to know whether they were saved or not. Now, I do know that in the early Matthew series, uh, the the Colonel theme said that uh, these were wise men and it indicated their salvation. But later on in his ministry, after studying these things, he came to surmise that uh, these people were probably under a lot of demon influence And that is where they received all of this knowledge. And I would probably go with that. But really, Scripture is silent as to all that. And Matthew is just bringing out the significance to the Jew that, hey, even these Gentiles recognized he was the king of the Jews. Why can't you recognize it if these Gentiles can recognize it? And that is why Matthew brings out the Magi. But a much uh, more, uh, a, a greater story is definitely about the shepherds, and that seems to have a more spiritual significance than these uh, characters here. <clears throat> so, after assembling all the chiefs, they said that he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And the reason why I keep going over this is I have this in a very small font. I don't know why I put it in such a small font. I should have made it bigger, and it's getting hard for me to read. In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, for it was written this way by the prophet. And that would be the prophet Micah, M-I-C-A-H. And this is in 2.6. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are in no way least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a sovereign ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So these scholars immediately knew that from the book of Micah that uh, it would come out of Judah and would be in Bethlehem. Then Herod privately summoned the Magi and determined from them when the star had appeared. He wanted to know about the time when Jesus Christ was born because he's already plotting in his mind he is going to kill this person. He doesn't want any competition, even though he is soon going to die himself. He does not want any competition when it comes to the rulership in Israel, so he wants to stamp this out. So he privately summoned the Magi and determined from them when the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and look carefully for this young child. When you find him, inform me so that I can go and worship him as well. Now, these magi weren't idiots. They were wise men, and uh, having the contact, if they did, with the demon world, they had a a lot of knowledge, especially about human nature, and uh, they knew uh, pretty much what he was up to. After listening to the king, they left, and once again the star they had seen in the east led them until it stopped above the place where the young child was. When they saw the star again... You see, the star had went away, and then it reappeared, and they saw it again, and they rejoiced with great joy. They're rejoicing with great joy over a star. And it doesn't say they were rejoicing because they had seen the Christ. But they will see the Christ, and then they will fall down and worship him as king of the Jews. It never says that they're falling down and worshiping him as the king of kings and lord of lords, their savior. Now, they may have believed. And they may have ended up there because they were positive and they may have believed. But scripture is silent about this. 
and we can't really surmise anything from who these people are. Their significance and simply in knowing they were Gentiles and knew something significant had happened. As they came into the house and saw the young child with Mary, his mother, they fell down and worshipped him the same way they would fall down and worship any human king. They opened their many treasure boxes and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And of course, frankincense is a very expensive incense used only for nobility. So they spent quite a hunk of money on our Lord. And then we have the myrrh, And the myrrh has significance, whether they knew it or not, the myrrh had significance in that myrrh is an incense that they use for the death of a king, of royalty. So the significance would be that Jesus Christ would die on the cross as a substitute for us. Whether they knew it or not, that's up to speculation. After they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph saying, get up. Take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you because Herod is going to look for the young child to kill him. Then he got up, took the child and his mother at night and went to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died, a terrible death. And in this way, what was spoken concerning the Lord through the prophet Hosea was fulfilled where it says, I called uh, my son out of Egypt. I see that I just skipped uh, several verses. We'll go back to it. So he privately uh, summoned the Magi and he went to them to Bethlehem saying, go and look carefully for the child. A bunch of nonsense. He didn't care. And after lifting, they left the king and they went to see the child. And they fell down and worshipped them and gold, frankincense, and myrrh is what they gave him. And then in verse 12, that's the verse I missed. After being warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back by another route to their own country. So they were warned by God in a dream and they went back by another route to their own country. Now remember from Luke, who else could have been there? Well, the shepherds. And what were they doing preaching the gospel? Did they believe? We don't know. But they did uh, receive uh, from God in a dream not to return to Herod. And they did so. And the fact that they were able to get by King Herod is significant in itself because King Herod had a massive system of spies and he knew just about everything from whence they came and where they were going. So for them to break through that uh, massive, uh, actually almost like a military line, Well, he kept a a huge eye on his border, unlike we keep an eye on ours. And everybody knew who was coming in and who was leaving. But they never once saw these magi. And they went on a different route and were not spotted. That's part of God's grace. And they went back home to Persia. Did they go back home as believers? I don't know. Were they believers to start with? Well, we can't surmise it from Scripture, really. Except that they did receive a dream from God. Did they become believers? Were they believers? It's not significant. But what is significant is that Gentiles knew that something significant had occurred, the birth of Christ. And Matthew says, Jews, wake up! Christ has been born. It's all been fulfilled in prophecy. Look at Isaiah. Look at the three warnings. He's here. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of your word. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us to the things that we note so that we might grow in grace and in knowledge. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.